Good evening and welcome to the Rural Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm Dr Lucy Ingram. Tonight we will consider two interesting cases. The first um, is in uh, irritable bowel syndrome and the second will be chronic liver disease. Discussing the first presentation tonight, we have our panel of experts consisting of Dr Ling King, GP Supervisor here in Toowoomba, Dr Andrew St John, Staff Specialist, Gastroenterologist at Toowoomba Hospital. We have um, Yvonne, our dietitian. Sorry, Yvonne, your last name? Chen. Chen, um, from Toowoomba. And also Mr Fred Yeo, our pharmacist here in Toowoomba as well. Can we please welcome our specialist and expert panellists? As usual, we are being live streamed around Australia. We have a number of participants watching remotely, so I encourage you all to join the discussion by emailing your questions to grandrounds at qrme.org.au or you can tweet your questions using the hashtag now on your screen. Our first presenter tonight is Nicole Catanash. Would you please make her welcome? Hi, my name's Nicole Katnak. I'm um, doing a presentation on irritable bowel disease. So I have a 16-year-old female um, who presents with the following symptoms. She states that she's always tired despite eating a very, um, a very good diet and is very strict with her diet. She states she can't tolerate a variety of food and has been like this for as long as she can remember. Her symptoms have been specifically worse over the last two years and they have been ex investigated extensively. She states that she gets abdominal pain, um, which is often associated with certain foods and passing stool often, but not always, relieves her abdominal pain. She has altered bowel habits, bloated, is blo often bloated and ha has wind pain as well. Um, so so this patient uh, says she opens her bowels most days. Um, she alternates between being very constipated uh, and is, but it can be have loose stools on other days. It depends what she eats. Uh, to compensate for this, she takes one Metamucil tablet a day. She denies any blood in the stool um, and she denies any mucus as well. Her weight has been stable. Um, and after I took a food diary of this patient, um, she eats the following meal on a, on a regular basis. Um, so for breakfast, she, she says, depending on how busy she is, she might have some gluten-free toast um, with eggs or some avocado on gluten-free toast. Uh, she might also either have gluten-free wheat bix um, and she is lactose intolerant and she has zimmel milk. If she's at school, she has rice crackers uh, or a variety of dried fruit and she can tolerate kiwi fruit as well. At lunch, depending on the time constraints, she'll have either broccoli, um, some vegetables, which are a combination of broccoli, corn, greens and capsicum, or she might make up a couscous. She has a very stable dinner, in, which consists of always having some meat and vegetables. In past medical history, uh, she's had multiple presentations to um, the, the different surgeries, um, but her past medical history mainly consists of glandular fever uh, and she had some ovarian cysts, which uh, one was removed, um, repaired laparoscopically. In terms of medications, uh, she uh, takes fish oil. She also takes a multivitamin and is on the oral contraceptive pill. In terms of family history, uh, this patient um, lives with her mother and her father died suddenly when she was a child from an accident. She denies any family history of cancer um, and, says she, uh, and has nil known allergies. So as I said, she lives with her mother. Um, she's in year 12 at school. She misses a considerable amount of school um, because of her fatigue levels and also abdominal pain. Um, she's a non-smoker or a drinker. 
So in terms of the examination, this girl is a tall, slim female. She weighs uh, 60 kilos and her height is 172. She's normotensive with a blood pressure of 111 on 71, afebrile, her heart rate's normal and her uh, heart sounds are normal with no added sounds. Her abdomen is very soft. She has general, generalised tenderness, um, but bowel sounds are present and there's no guarding. There's no lymph nodes enlarged as well. So this, not ordered all by myself, but on multiple occasions, this is the, uh, the investigations that have been ordered um, over the last uh, 12 months. So she's had a full blood count, which is all normal. Her ELFT, she has normal UNE, her, a good kidney function and her, thyroid, her liver function is normal. Her inflammatory markers are all normal. She's shown to be iron deficient uh, with a ferritin of 23. Um, her B12 is also low with her B12 being 120, 164 but her active B12 being 30. Her folate is normal. She's had celiac antibodies uh, requested on a few occasions and they are normal. Um, her, uh, her stool sample MCS and OCP is normal and her, the multiplex has also been normal. She had a gastroscopy and a colonoscopy two years ago. The gastroscopy report uh, showed a normal esophagus, stomach and duodenal mucosa and the biopsies were all normal. Her colonoscopy, um, there were two um, colon, uh, polyps um, that showed on histology that there were hyperplastic polyps. She was, the rest of the colon um, looked essentially otherwise normal and she was requested to have a repeat colonoscopy in five years. The current management for this patient is she has seen a dietitian two years ago. Um, she was introduced to the FODMAP diet um, and said she excluded a lot of foods and, decided, and found that her most intolerance was to lactose and gluten. So she sticks to, sticks to a very uh, strict lactose and gluten-free diet. She has a Metamucil tablet daily and she's recently commenced iron and B12 replacement. Um, so my questions to the um, panel list is, um, is panelist is firstly, uh, is this a case of irritable bowel, or is there other things that I should be thinking of? Um, should this patient have a repeat colonoscopy earlier, given that she has a hyperplastic polyp and now is on iron, is iron deficient? And, and if it is ir irritable bowel syndrome, what is the mainstay of treatment? I would also like to know if there's a role for probiotics or any other pharmaceutical agents which could assist this patient with her symptoms. And how effective is the FODMAP diet or am I making her diet too restrictive if I also um, cut down on her fructose? Thanks. Thanks, Nicole. That was a really interesting case. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of questions there to get uh, get our teeth into, but I thought um, we might just start um, sort of coming back a little bit and just asking um, perhaps Lynn, if we can <laughs> start with you, um, what would be your sort of approach as a, as a GP um, seeing a patient like this, a young patient with such a restrictive diet? How would you approach this sort of well, case? Well, I'd go back one step because really mm. this lass is a lass that's frequently coming to the doctor. Um, is a, not able to go to school, so she's avoiding school, maybe yeah. maybe due to ill health, maybe school avoidance, no, it's not clear. Mm. Um, and alas, that um, has been investigated, so there's obviously a request either from her or from her mother um, to investigate and investigate, because that amount of investigation is, um, is excessive at that age, even for someone that... Um, um, we may ultimately diagnose with irritable bowel disease. <clears throat> I mean, she hasn't had any PR bleeding. She's had no weight loss. So indications for gastroscopies is not strong. Mm. Um, I'm not saying she shouldn't have had it. I'm just saying it's not a strong indication. I mean, probably like 
mm -hmm. um, the gastroenterologist's opinion about that. Yeah, so why don't we um, well, throw at that it point, to you. Yeah. yeah, Andrew, what do yes. you think of... Uh, thank you for, the, for directing that to me. Um, <laughs> <coughs> this is obviously quite a common problem, uh, not so much at this age, although I think it's increasingly being seen, but uh, managing young patients with significant disabling symptoms um, uh, without doing an endoscopy or colonoscopy, and that's part of the problem, is how do you avoid doing tests, invasive tests in patients who have a very low chance of you actually finding pathology or finding a treatable cause for their symptoms? And in this case, if you have any, any patient, if they're missing school or missing work, I think that's becoming pretty significant, as Lynn suggested. We do need to take that seriously, even if it's likely to be irritable bowel syndrome at the end of the day. Um, it's hard to, to manage patients like this if you haven't done extensive investigations because you need to be confident that you're, you're not missing anything. Mm. Um, in terms of other tests that you could do beforehand, um, a faecal calprotectin, is a, is, I find, <coughs> is an excellent test um, for excluding significant inflammatory bowel problems. Uh, and in this patient, probably would have been normal and that may have steered you away from doing a colonoscopy. And I believe it was done two years ago, so I'm assuming she was 14 when mm. that was done. So that's, that's pretty young. Mm. And um, ordinarily, in, if you're a patient like this in Brisbane, I suppose you'd be referred to a paediatric gastroenterologist. And I think that they generally try and avoid doing unnecessary procedures in children much more than we do as adult gastroenterologists. But then again, once again, this is a patient who's seriously disabled. Uh, so I think you would be hard pressed to avoid doing it. Now, the finding of a hyperplastic polyp brings mm. in another question because that, that probably is a sessile serrated adenoma because it was found in the right colon and that actually is a significant finding not in the context of her symptoms, yeah. but in the context of her being at increased risk of bowel cancer and needing surveillance, you know, possibly every five years going forward. And so finding that in a young patient is quite significant and we don't fully know the family history because of the father passing away early, but uh, that is, a, is still a significant finding. It won't help manage the patient's symptoms though. And what would be the follow-up of, of that sort of a finding <coughs> in a patient this young? How often would you well, screen? The screening, you treat a sessile serrated adenoma like any other adenoma and uh, according to the guidelines you would, you would repeat after five years. So I, I agree with the recommendation that was given. Um, you always are a little bit nervous when you have someone who's getting polyps at such a young age. Um, but given the number, mm. sometimes you see young patients with 10, 20 polyps, they may have FAP or something. That would certainly make you nervous but I think Increasingly, we do colonoscopies on young patients, particularly young women, and we do find sessile serrated adenomas quite often, teenagers in their 20s and 30s, and they all enter surveillance programs and there's no evidence uh, for what we should be doing, but I think that's perfectly reasonable. Mm. Mm. Great. Mm. If I can ask you, Yvonne, uh, what do you think of her diet? It's quite restricted. Yes, it is very restrictive, and also I think we should take the social context into consideration for this patient. So she's tall and slim and she's 16 year old female and she's missing schools. Yeah. Um, and she is actively seeking for a quite restrictive diet. Mm -hmm. And um, that would flag me, does this person have any eating disorder mm. intentions or, and if you take that back one step for celiac disease diagnosis, uh, I have been wondering when and what time those uh, tests were done. Is that before she has gone to a gluten-free diet or mm. after she has gone to a gluten-free diet? Mm. So if she has been gluten-free for a significant amount of time, then all these antibodies are gonna come back negative and mm. so does the biopsies. And mm. so the, all these tests wouldn't actually exclude the possibility she has celiac disease. Mm. Um, and interestingly, she also got iron deficiencies. Mm, and B12 as well. Yes, and B12. So it is still possible that she actually has celiac disease. Celiac. Um, and also um, another thing is, even she has, just supposedly she has irritable bowel syndrome. Um, it is a very restrictive diet. So low food map diet is a diet that is low in fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. Um, and that diet is actually not a lifelong diet. 
Uh, it is more like elimination diet. So you do the diet for about six to eight weeks to see the symptom improves or not, and then you will try to challenge the patient, try to in reintroduce the food. So at the end of the day, it is not a very restrictive diet. Your goal is to find out what are the foods that is causing the problem. Mm. I was just going to say, there's some good points there. You're mm. right. Diagnosing celiac disease will be very difficult in someone who mm. insists on not having gluten. A lot of these patients, mind you, are not on an absolutely strict gluten-free diet. So some, I mean, obviously if you have celiac disease, that's what you're told to do, but she may not be on a strict gluten-free diet. Um, uh, but you see a lot of patients these days who are self-prescribing a gluten-free diet for symptoms similar to this. Mm. Uh, and it's an increasing problem. And some patients are so adamant that it's bad for them <laughs> that they won't even accept a challenge of gluten if you're trying to make a diagnosis. Uh, so it can, be, it can be quite problematic. Um, but I have to say, if you stop gluten in almost anyone in the population, they will feel better. So... Uh, it's quite common for these patients to, to take this approach. And I'm sure that they feel better off gluten. Um, but you're right, the iron deficiency, probably quite common in young women. Mm. The B12 deficiency as well, that's a little bit unusual. And I think that, that certainly would warrant further investigation. I think if you're, the, if you're fronting up to your gastroenterologist with iron and B12 deficiency, that's one more reason for them to do mm. a gastro certainly a gastroscopy, maybe a colonoscopy as well. But she had a few things going on there. And I mean... Mm. Even with her dietary restriction, she shouldn't really be deficient in anything, you know. She's eating mm. meat, so it is a little bit unusual, I have to say. Mm. Um, and in terms of restrictive diets, this I've seen a lot worse. <laughs> uh, what do you think of the nutritional content, sorry, Yvonne, about the gluten-free foods? Um, what are the main sort of things that you find with patients that are using those gluten-free products? Um, well, certainly gluten-free diet is a very restrictive diet if you follow that strictly. Mm. And it does cause a lot of burden and um, also a lot of social burden. So it's mm. very difficult for you to eat out and also it's quite hard for you to prepare the food at home because you're going to avoid the cross-contamination. And at, at the same time, a lot of those gluten-free bread or gluten-free pasta, they tend to be higher in GI than the normal weight products. But however, if a person is going on gluten-free, it is easier for them to eat um, healthier. So that's why most people is perceiving gluten-free diet is healthier because a lot of pastries, sweets, mm. they, are, they contain, yes, so exactly, they contain gluten. So um, I think currently there are some misperceptions about this gluten-free diet. Okay. I, I, I also think that's why it's very hard to be really strict on it. And if you're not <clears throat> on it for medical reasons, like you have celiac disease, and people, when they go out or they travel, they can't avoid gluten in some situations. Mm. Even patients with celiac disease have this problem when they're travelling. But, um, you know, you'd be very surprised if someone like this was truly on a strict gluten-free diet, which means that, like, biopsies and things uh, probably would be diagnostic, but you can't be sure. And the only thing I would say is you can do HLA genotyping for patients who you think might be at risk of celiac disease. Um, mm. It's not a diagnostic test, but it, it will identify a uh, population who are at risk um, of having it. And if your genotype is negative, your risk of having this is, is quite low indeed. Mm. Um, so if you have someone who, who absolutely can't have gluten and you'd like to know what their risk is, then that's a test mm. you can do. Is that test very costly, most genetic tests? It may be. I don't actually know the cost of no, it. I, th I think it's Medicare rebatable from memory, but that mm -hmm. is only from memory. I have mm -hmm. ordered it once or twice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. May, may I ask a question mm. of mm. Andrew? Um, irritable bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, mm. it really is only a syndrome, isn't it? Yes. Is it, meaning that I tend to say to patients that it's, we've found nothing seriously wrong with your bowel, mm. but it's a very sensitive bowel. Mm. And um, but it's not a, a disease process. So is that the correct way to explain, or is mm. that too simplistic? Well, I think it comes down to terminology. Whether you're calling it a disease or a syndrome, I think calling it irritable bowel disease just gets confusing because you it would abbreviate to IBD. Yeah. But uh, mm. I think um, the the cardinal feature of of the disorder is um, the visceral hypersensitivity. So we know that in the general population, people with diarrhoea or constipation 
are not necessarily complaining of abdominal pain and cramping and bloating mm. like these patients do. So the main thing that you need is the visceral hypersensitivity and then you try and delineate between diarrhea predominance and constipation predominant because that can dictate some of the medical therapies. Um, but I mean, mm. it's always good to reassure the patients that nothing serious is there. It may be a lifelong condition that they need to manage. Um, one of my previous uh, supervisors who specialised in functional bowel diseases said that um, you can reassure your patients that they will live a long and miserable life because they will be extensively investigated and uh, they are certain never to develop any GI cancers because they've had so many <laughs> scopes. Uh, but their symptoms will persist despite all the best efforts of doctors and, and yeah. other allied health staff. Um, but it, it, the other thing that's true is it is really a first world problem. Um, this is not something that you would see much in the, the developing world. Um, and that's because we don't have to worry about finding mm -hmm. food. We don't have lots of other things that bother us. And I think one thing to point out, although we, we glossed over briefly, is the fact that her father died mm -hmm. suddenly mm -hmm. and she was presumably quite young at that stage, is it often coexists with other conditions like anxiety and depression as well as eating disorders. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is worthwhile uh, looking into because if you adequately treat someone's anxiety disorder, mm. uh, that may be the most effective intervention um, and certainly much more effective than a lot of the things that gastroenterologists uh, prescribe. Mm. Um, mm. And because a lot of depression and anxiety manifests as GI symptoms and that's mm. why you can never find anything organic. Mm. Yeah. I think we might hold this thought and come back to it in a second. Yeah. I think I'd like to come over to Fred, our pharmacist, and say that, you know, a lot of these patients, before they come into the GP or mm -hmm. to see the specialist, will come into the pharmacy right. looking for something to ease their symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a bit about some of the more popular products and, and what um, people are using in the community? I think people normally come into the pharmacy explaining about their symptoms mm. and um, in this patient in particular, she has been to so many tests and investigations. Uh, my questions to the doctors would be, or to the patient, would be, have you managed your symptoms as it arises? For example, mm -hmm. some people will have constipations and alternate bowel motions and flatulence. Uh, are these symptoms being managed when it arises? Mm -hmm. Instead of trying to investigate mm -hmm. thoroughly. Mm -hmm. And most people will come to the pharmacy looking for a particular natural or homeopathic product, complementary, thinking that they have been through so many tests and you know, investigation, and the doctor can't tell them everything. Um, we generally do suggest other things such as your probiotics. Mm -hmm. um, there is a product made by a German company, they call uh, Iberogas or Iberogas. Mm -hmm. Now it is a blend of nine different herbs um, when, it's, when it was introduced to a pharmacy, we get a bit sceptical about natural products. But oh. we've done a few trials in, among our patients with really bad IBS symptoms, and most of them come back saying significant improvement in their bowel, um, less side effects, and improved quality of life generally. And that's why they come back and give them uh, the feedback. Uh, half and half of the patient come back using probiotics and say, yep, they have improved the symptoms to some extent. Uh, but in people with IBS, we, we do suggest, you know, look, if you have constipation, just need to do proper treatment that is specific to the constipation and reassure that it is a temporary symptoms that is arise and treat diarrhea accordingly and reassurance and then peppermint oil just a lot of reassurance in our customer base. And generally that helps to uh, boost up their confidence in terms of managing their symptoms properly. Mm, great. Yeah, yeah um, as a gastroenterologist, what, what do you find in terms of these um, sort of herbal mm. or natural sort of over-the-counter products or probiotics? Well, a lot of, I mean, oil? A, yeah, a lot of patients have had a lot of medical therapy before they even see us, um, particularly when they've had long-standing symptoms. And uh, I know that there's, there is quite a lot of literature in favour of using Ibrogast. It's specifically for functional dyspepsia, uh, of which there may be a component of that in, in your patient. So particularly postprandial abdominal discomfort. And uh, it's one of the few sort of herbal or natural uh, remedies that's, uh, that's performed well in clinical trials. Uh, so gastroenterologists will also prescribe that. Uh, and as, as we know, a lot of patients are very keen to take that that sort of uh, treatment rather than medical therapy and, you, and possibly for good reason. I believe people who 
have functional symptoms that respond to PPI therapy often also respond to ibrogast. And I guess the, um, the push away from PPI therapy in, in a lot of our patients uh, for s- certain concerns, whether they're founded or unfounded, uh, would mean medications like ibrogast are probably safer um, for patients in the long term. So I think if patients respond to it, I think it's definitely a good option. Uh, generally speaking, though, if a patient has tried anything over the counter and they find it's helpful, I wouldn't discourage them from taking it. Um, the only thing I would discourage patients from doing is taking medication that makes no difference uh, to their symptoms because some patients do that and it's only uh, going to be that they end up throwing away their money because this is a disease where you're purely trying to control the symptoms. So if you're taking something that is not improving the symptoms, you can really forget about it and I encourage all my patients to do that especially for things that I've prescribed. Mm. Um, if they don't find it doesn't work, don't keep taking it, just mm. because a doctor says so. Mm. Something patients sometimes ask me about um, probiotics is that they're so popular now that there's lots of different types available. <coughs> is one type better than another type? What do you think, Fred? Well, to my understanding, they are all quite equivalent. Mm. There's some literature that highlights certain strain of bacteria, uh, but there's no solid literature to say that one is better than the other. So it all mm. comes down to um, the, I guess, the uh, affordability of certain probiotics and whether they are taking it as a regular basis. Because mm. this is not something that you take for one or two days and then expect that to work properly. Mm. And that works really good in conjunction with healthy diet as well, uh, stress reduction as um, mm. emphasized by the uh, specialist. And these are the things that we tell our customer all the time, reassurance um, and uh, confident building in managing their symptoms. Mm. Right. Mm. Um, Yvonne, if I can come back to you, and with a patient with um, irritable bowel, is there specific advice that you usually give them with regards to their diet? Um, yes, I guess the first thing that we need to find out is which part of the food map that they are actually malabsorbing. Mm-hmm. And there's um, actually a test that, that they can do, it's called a hydrogen brace test. Mm-hmm. Um, so that can easily test out um, if the patient is malabsorbing lactose or sorbitol, which is a polio, or fructose. Um, so if the patient can do those tests, that'll be a great thing. So we could just target those things and eliminate these things out of the diet. Mm. However, if the patient um, could not perform the test somehow, then we progress that to a strict elimination diet. So to take out all the food maps, and then the patient will stay on that diet for about six to eight weeks Mm -hmm. to see if there's any improvement in the symptoms. If there's an improvement, then we we say, okay, so food map is working. However, we're gonna try to reintroduce some of this food into your diet. And we will only try to introduce one thing at a time. Say if we'll we'll only introduce um, Mm disoclase, so we'll introduce lactose or will introduce um, oligosaccharides, so fructans, like to get the patient to eat bread again, or to get the patient to eat fruit, to introduce the fructose bed again, mm. so that we find out what ex- is exactly causing the problem. Mm. Now, um, looking at the FODMAP diet, there's some um, interesting sort of um, like vegetables as well as fruits and things that have some of these things in it, isn't it? It's sort of a bit of an eclectic mix in some of these groups of things that people might not recognise initially as, you know, belonging together in the same group. Do you give them lots of literature to take home on this sort of um, thing or pictorial things or how, how do you guide people through those, um, those um, you know, big elimination diets? They are quite a few uh, resources out there. So mm. um, Monash, they actually do a low food map app Mm -hmm. So people can download that app and look out what other things are high in fructose. Everything's on a smartphone these days. Yes, everything (laughs) on a smartphone. And they also have these recipe books or booklets that they can purchase from them. Um, And if uh, they got referred to a dietitian and the dietitian can actually um, access all this information online for them Mm -hmm. and then talk them through and try to guide them to go through that elimination phase. Because for most patients, the problem is not actually to get onto a low food map diet, is to reintroduce the food into the mm. diet again. Mm. Yeah. 
I was just wanting to come back, I think, to some of the things we touched on a bit earlier in terms of the psychological aspects um, of this case. I thought, um, Lynn, maybe you might like to sort of draw that out a little bit, um, you know, well, in I, the case of functional yeah. bowel disease and, and um, psychological yeah. aspects. Well, this lass has obviously been to the doctor a lot of times and mm. uh, what we don't know is whether she's coming or whether her mother's bringing her. There's, there's a lot of psychological stuff, I think, happening here and it's mm. not straightforward today but um and so um and even though it's mostly representing in gut symptoms there's that still needs to be teased out um uh, whether or not um so the fact she's not going to school the fact that she's often tired um these symptoms would tend to make one concerned about her she's got an anxiety issues are there depression issues are there um all that stuff. So this this lass, at some point, I'd be wanting to have a nice talk to her about her life without her mother in the room, um, trying to sort out what the psychological things, what things are happening to her, why, try to work out why she's not going to school, are there other reasons, you know, is she able to go out socially but just not to school, or this, this type of thing. Mm. And it probably is something that's a little bit beyond just the GP from the point of view she probably would benefit from some good psychological input in as well mm. if if she and her mother accept that there may be a psychological component because there will be with this situation mm. um, so therefore that's a <coughs> I guess you know a mental health plan and 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 your favorite psychologist who will relate to teenage girl um, eating disorders would come to my mind very quickly but she hasn't lost weight and mm -hmm. so but which is encouraging because eating disorders are so difficult to treat mm. but yeah so mm. uh, at this age at 16 um, you're at the stage now where she could be referred to an adult psychiatrist if you think that it's that complex mm. um, and uh, you're also at the stage where yeah, there then becomes the issues if you do want to prescribe an antidepressant or anti-anxiety agent for this lass, what are you going to choose? <clears throat> There's a lot of issues with what is suitable um, for adolescents. Mm -hmm. um, um, meaning, uh, you know, there's the risk there because of reported risk and mother may well have read that if we're going to use antidepressants in a teenage lass, um, you know, there's increased suicide um, reputation of some of the medication. Mm -hmm. So that opens all of that um, kind of discussion as well. But in my experience, I don't think I have one patient that I've got irritable bowel syndrome on their mm -hmm. past history who is not also on um, an antidepressant or has been at some point mm -hmm. or has needed psychological input in their lives. Mm -hmm. I would not have any exclusions. Mm -hmm. And I... Um, I very rarely make the diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome because I tend to think, I tell people they've got sensitive bowels, I tell people that their psychological issues affect their bowel, but I don't like labelling that, mm -hmm. that onto someone because I really think that the psychological is the bigger trigger. I'm mm. not saying people, that I've got lots of patients with erratic bowels, but to try to not have them just <coughs> focusing on that. But focusing on the other parts of their life that um, that need assistance, you know, yeah. that's mine. Yeah, you're nodding a lot there, Andrew. Is mm. this something that is an aspect of patients that you see a lot? Definitely, mm. definitely. I think um, if, you, if you think of the big picture for this girl, I mean, mm. she'll probably finish school, but we know that patients with significant problems with anything like this, bowel problems, uh, that uh, they tend to be exacerbated by stress, so she won't function very well in the coming towards the end of high school. Um, but how is she going to function after that? Is she going to be able to go to university where she's more independent and having to study on her own um, and the social stressors that go along with that? And then how will she function when she starts working? Mm. Uh, you occasionally get patients who are at the more malignant end of the spectrum with their irritable bowel syndrome and they miss work a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that's going to be a big deal. And, and people may end up uh, on disability pensions even for severe symptoms. Um, in, inability to, you know, go to school is, is a very bad starting point. Mm -hmm. And I think you need mm -hmm. to get 
you need to get to the bottom of it. And I, I think that's that's the way you're going to do it. In in general, um, uh, we sometimes prescribe antidepressants for these patients, and it kind of depends on the pattern of the symptoms and the, the type of patient. Frequently, patients in this in this category would re report that they have difficulty sleeping, they suffer from, from insomnia, um, and if they're uh, disabled by pain particularly, then they often would be started on a tricyclic antidepressant at a low dose like amitriptyline. Um, and, uh, but if they're if someone like this who's more on the underweight side and you would encourage eating, you might um, think of something else that has a sedative effect like uh, possibly metazapine. Um, but then a lot of them will end up on SSRIs uh, as well, which would, is a perfectly reasonable choice also. But um, the non-pharmacological therapies are still very important and just encouraging patients to exercise regularly makes a big difference in functional GI disorders. It probably takes their mind off their bowel symptoms. Uh, and so generally speaking, patients who exercise have co complain a lot less of their symptoms. So even simple things like mm. that can make a huge difference. And I go back to the medical therapy side of things mm. very quickly, but it's actually critical that you differentiate between a constipated patient and a non-constipated patient because mm. constipated patients can get overflow diarrhoea, which confuses the issue, and they'll come in and complain mm. of loose bowel motions predominantly, and if they're taking gastro stop or they're prescribed gastro stop, mm. that'll make them worse. Uh, um, and they're more likely to benefit from things like coloxal and other things. And there is a great reluctance in the community to use regular uh, laxative agents or aperients. Um, and we suffer the consequences of long-term long constipation because we don't treat things adequately. And I think if you've clearly identified someone who's constipated, they should be treated. And then that, that potentially opens up a whole other kettle of fish in, in terms of functional constipation as a separate disorder, which is frequently associated with a lot of other things, including previous history of sexual abuse. So. It all stems back to, to what we've been talking about, but these patients often have a lot of issues that they don't mm. reveal mm. immediately. And mm. once, once they've uh, become your regular patient and you establish rapport with them, you can go into this in a lot more detail. But I think that the most useful interventions are those targeting the, the psychological aspects of their disease, certainly. And I think that the medical therapy is right at the other end and to manage their symptoms to make, make things a bit easier for them. But I think really... You have to look at their lifestyle modifications, look at their diet, their exercise, and then go back to do they have underlying anxiety, depression, and other things. I think that's the most important approach. Great. Yeah, so, Lynn, would this be a GP management plan or a GP mental health care plan or both? Oh, I, I think... Um if the, I think if the psychological issues, if you're not happy to, if you're capable of managing that, but this is a complicated lass, so I think she mm. needs a mental health plan, I think she needs psychology and or psychiatry, um, because her functioning level is very poor and, and mm. you know, we've got to start to get her functioning, uh, not as in, as in getting back to school and, and things like that. Um, um, yeah. That's all I would do um, at this point, yeah. Mm, definitely. Um, I think she's already seen a dietitian and um, and she's focusing... At, it, you're not going to talk her into altering... She's worked out what she wants for her diet. Mm. That She's already decide, made her decision that she's got celiac mm. disease and lactose intolerance, in mm. a way. Um, you can live that way, that's fine. It's But you've got to... I think it's... Yeah, the psychological issues need to be explored with this lass. That's where I'd be going at this point. Yeah. Mm. It's, it would be hard to reverse all of that that's established in her mind now. Because if you want someone to be carefree about their gut and their mm. diet, that will be very hard to do in this girl, I think. Because she's, she's so conscious of, of, of her symptoms and what she's eating. That, um, mm. But that may, that may be partially therapeutic for her, mm. but it would be difficult... Um, to steer her clear of that, because ideally you want your patients to be not at all worried about their bowel symptoms, um, but it's it's not it's not necessarily possible. I think in this girl it would be mm. extremely difficult to do. Yeah. yeah, and there's the other mm. side: is she focusing on her bowel and her pain and all this because of so much other stuff? And I think that's mm. what all of us are, are worried about: what is all the other stuff that's making her focus on her bowel and her diet mm. as a way to mm. not talk about not. 
she may be entitled denial. She may not even understand what all the other stuff is. Mm. Um, um, Lynn, so, as mm -hmm. registrars approaching that, because it can be hard, um, you know, as mm. registrars sort of feeling, you know, perhaps that they haven't had many years of experience mm. and, and so on, to approach these sorts of issues um, where um, the medical opinion is quite different from what the patient perceives. Um, mm. and the patient has perceived that it's primarily a bowel issue when in fact when you, when you start to look at it you realise it's, it may be more mm. of a psychological issue. Um, how do you approach that conversations mm. to maintain that rapport with the patient um, well, and get them on yeah. site? This is the same for chronic bowel or the chronic pain issue and this overlaps mm. this patient anyway. So yes, they have a perception and you think that that's only a small part of the problem. Well, first of all, you're going to have many episodes to fix it, to try to work it out. It doesn't have to be done in this consultation. Mm -hmm. This lass has already come many times, and it's so if you're a if you, it's important to establish rapport, to um, and then just to slowly build and um, listen listen to her kind of. And it, I think at different times. Um, There'll probably be something in each consultation that you could lat latch on to um, to try to help them to get a little bit of insight into where they are. So, for instance, this last when she says, but I'm always so tired, it's yeah. easy to say your blood count is normal, all right, your ferritin may be a bit low, but you're... we haven't found a true physical reason for her tiredness. So that's something you could start to talk about. Well, maybe there's another cause for your tiredness. You're eating, you've got, you know, you're trying to eat well, you do, and, and, and then maybe say, well, some people who get, who um, tiredness is also a symptom of, for people who are depressed mm -hmm. or for people who've got too many worries. They emotionally tire themselves. Um, or for people who are too worried, um, um, well, whatever, you know, just make some other... What to talk about tiredness. And then does any of that apply to you, you know? And open okay. it up like that. So normalising mm. it. Normalising. And then saying, is that how, you, you know, well, what may be your oh, I just say listening to some of the history. Mm. And if there's some history there that you want to latch on to, that you don't want to be <coughs> put into the irritable bowel syndrome part of the story, mm. you want to direct to the psychological part of the story, you know? Mm. And right. then if it's someone you're going to see for whatever reason, I mean, oh, sometimes just getting that history and asking them about their family and da 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 da, da. And I mean, you, at some point you should be asking this lass, you know, how are you since your dad has died and your family and, and, and the stress or the... Is your family coping well? Are you coping well? Mm. Is mum right. coping well? You know, um because we all should take a family history at some point, whether... Um, and as a registrar, I think a good thing as a registrar is actually to redo the family history and the past history. <laughs> You've got this patient, they've just walked in after a couple of visits. I think it's a good thing to say, oh, you know, I don't know you that well yet. And, um, oh, we're supposed to have the computer screen all up to date and have your past history right and your family history right. Look, I'll click on it here now. Mm. Now let's just get this family history right, you know, have we got mm. it here? You know, and that's a lead, that's just a lead in that I say to registrars or even for myself with a new patient, a lead in to know their background. Mm. And, and another thing is, um, oh, there's a lot of things on your past history. Do -do 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 -do. I'd hate to think for this last how many items were going to be on the past history page. But mm. there might be something there that you can say, oh, Doctor last year wrote in um, insomnia. Well, that's just bad sleeping. Um, there's lots of reasons for that, why you can't sleep. Mm. Were there any other things causing you not to sleep well when we wrote that down last year? Um, you're just looking for ways to open up the psychological stuff for this lass mm. or for any lass, any person, mm. if you're trying to explore that, that other side that we know is contributing to the illness and they're not... Yeah. yeah, that's that, a great tip. That, well, they're just thoughts. Yeah. Mm. I, I think, because I think registrars, um, sometimes you just see the problem as what's there in front of you and you say, I've got to fix that today. We've got the tummy pain. Whereas it, we, we're not going to fix this lass's tummy pain today. <clears throat> we're, we need to be sure that she hasn't got appendicitis today, and we, but we also need to make rapport and we also. 
need to be just, yeah, just enlarging that consultation in some way. You've got 15, 20 minutes. If you're a basic registrar, you're only seeing three an hour. You've got a little bit of time just to... Dig deeper. Not just give the... Well, you can give the colloxalin centre if you think it's constipation and mm -hmm. you can say... But just that bit more of just expanding it a bit. Yeah. That, right. That's just mm -hmm. my thoughts about how to approach it. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we're getting towards the end of our time for this first segment. Is there anything that you guys want to desperately pop in there? Last minute thoughts? I, I wanted to say, yes, in addition to that, I don't find it particularly difficult to broach the subject on particularly anxiety related symptoms because when you say, look, I know that your symptoms are much worse when you're under stress or you're anxious and then you can, you can lead in that way and say, so do you find yourself feeling anxious a lot of the time? What kind of things make you feel anxious? And of course, some patients, the history is already there. They've been treated before. They've had major problems before. They develop bowel symptoms possibly, but you can lead into it. The problem is some patients, you know, it's very hard to get that information out of them and you just have to just ask every so often, ask on a regular basis. It's like getting someone to stop smoking. You keep challenging them with that 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 point. And I, I remember once a patient I was seeing numerous times over the course of 12 months who had globus symptoms, which of course there was no organic cause for. And I kept asking her about anxiety and depression. And then just before I was ready to discharge her back to her GP, um, she constantly denied anything. She said, oh, my father had bipolar and committed suicide when I was young. And then she walked out of the room and I went, oh, uh, that's probably significant. <laughs> but um, some patients, they, they're just not very open and um, it takes a long time to get that information out. Um, but it, it is well worth it because once you sort of open that Pandora's box, um, you'll get a lot more out of the patient. The therapeutic relationship will improve and the patient will do a lot better. And the only other thing is one test that I'm particularly fond of uh, which is a good test to do for patients who particularly complain of diarrhoea. It's just a plain abdominal x-ray. This is for mm. GP trainees. This, the, if patients have significant faecal loading on their abdominal x-ray, they don't have pathological mm. diarrhoea. It's just impossible. You know patients with ulcerative colitis, they never have, they're never constipated, they never have faecal loading with their active disease. So that's just a very simple test. Mm -hmm. I order it a lot. It's like, it's equivalent to say, if you send someone for a colonoscopy who complains of diarrhoea, and the report comes back saying, poor PrEP. You think, how can that be possible? Um, mm. If the patient took their PrEP and it was still bad, they're probably just constipated. And I think a lot of constipation is subclinical. In my, and in my mm. opinion, mm. at least half the patients I see in clinic are actually constipated and they don't know it. <laughs> so start them on colloxal first before sending them to the gastroenterologist? Oh, no, you don't have to start, but think about <laughs> it. Don't prescribe something which will have the opposite effect to what you, what you want. So I think the patient's... I mean, the patients have pain and are constipated in the background. They might be getting endone and gastro stop and by the time they see you, it's just a mess. Their, their symptoms mm. are much, much worse mm. uh, and, and they, they, they can be extremely disabled. And once they're on opioids for long periods of time, they are very, very hard to manage. Mm. Very, very hard, yeah. And the same mm. with children too. Funny mm. pains mm. in children. Get the plain X-ray. There's yeah. a lot of constipation in children. Um, and, uh, because yeah. Yeah, people, you know, so, so you say, what's your normal bowel habit? And they say, well, I go every second day and that's normal for them. Some, some people, it's, they go once a week and you say, you ask them, is your bowel habit regular? Is it normal for you? And they say, yes, but that's, that's what they mean. That's normal. And then they, mm. they live with that for years and years and years and they, they assume that that's normal for them. Um, and so they're not even aware that there's a problem. So I think it's, mm. it's worth exploring. Mm. Right. Well, that's been very interesting case discussion and panel discussion, but unfortunately we need to wrap up this segment. We are now going to have a short intermission. Thank you to our expert panel and their, for their extremely valuable discussion. Stay with us for the second segment from 8pm.